afternoon, everyone. I'm Shiva Priya from SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Ramapra. I would like to welcome you all to Paths Industry Speaks Digital. Today, we have Dr. Jay Ganesh, Senior Vice President and Head, Emphasis Next Labs, who will be speaking on the topic, Building and Scaling Enterprise Great Mission Learning Systems. After the speaker session, we will have a small quiz continued by two student teams from SRM IST Ramapuram and Velala College of Engineering and Technology who will be presenting on few interesting topics. And then this event will be concluded by an open question and answer section. Before moving on to the session, I kindly request you all to follow the Zoom call code of content. That is, all are requested to stay muted if you are not the speaker. Please record your attendance in the attendance form, which has been posted in the chat box. If you have not already registered, please register with the registration form as well as the attendance form. You can ask your questions during the question and answer session and feedback will be posted at the end of the session. You can submit your feedback at the end of the session. Now I request Mr. Ramaswamy and Mr. Venkat Ram and Ravi who will be giving the introduction to Paz. Over to you, sir. And thank you, Ms. Sivya Priya. Uh, speaker of the day, Dr. Jay Ganesh and uh, Vice Principal Dr. G. Prabhakaran, I hope he has joined, of SRM Ramapuram, eager faculty and students. Hmm. PALS started out in 2012 with a small lecture series and has grown from strength to strength with the help of our uh, industry partners and the partner in help of the feedback from the partner institutes. So it would not be in my scope now to explain the whole of PALS, but in the year 2021-22, PALS is committed to delivering the industry-centric programs with the learning opportunities for the faculty and staff, and uh, we have uh, strengthened the industry support. So that is uh, the theme, and uh, this came about because last year, Everything was in uh, virtual mode. Earlier, the speakers had to come down to the place and only two co few colleges could be covered in a, an event. But now all the colleges can log in. And uh, we have been able to bring to the board table very qualified and experienced speakers with uh, a rich experience in their uh, domain. And therefore, today's speaker is one such, and we have Dr. Jay Ganesh. And as Sivapriya already said, the topic is building and scaling enterprise grade machine learning systems. Dr. Jay Ganesh, he's a proven person in the digital transformation and innovation. He's a leader in his own right, but the privilege of introducing him belongs to the host college, so I would not be introducing him, except that he's uh, on the cutting edge of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And just a few words, as a person, I was involved in conventional manufacturing for the past 40 years. And then the challenge was to maintain the process within the limits, be it in terms of uh, machine condition, be it in terms of tooling, or be it in terms of other process parameters. And uh, it was really a challenging in those days i sim i do not i am not an expert on machine learning i am going i am a student today but i do understand that ml and ai can be a powerful tool to keep all these resources and the process parameters under control mm -hmm. so if i were to start the career today uh, i would uh, it would be a different uh, ball game altogether and dr jay ganesh has been kind enough to give subtopics ml ops and machine learning life cycle srm will be able to, they'll be doing it. And then auto ML for automated machine learning. It's well alert. And the teams have already been briefed to be very brief and not to read out from the slides. But at the outset, I'm repeating those instructions. And uh, without wanting to take any more of your time, I'll hand over back to the MC for further proceedings. Thank you. make a good use of your opportunity. That's one thing I would like to tell you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Thank you, sir, for your precise introduction. It gives me immense pleasure and honor to invite Dr. G. Prabhakaran, Vice Principal of SRM ISD Ramapuram. He graduated in production engineering from NIT and post graduated in manufacturing technology. He was awarded with PhD in production engineering from NIT, one of the premier technical institutions in India. He is an experienced accommodation with over 30 years of expertise at various levels in mechanical and production engineering disciplines, who also worked at various institutions. He is always known for providing the vision and leadership required to ensure a high quality education to the students community. I now request him to deliver his speech. Uh, thank you, Madam. Indeed, it's my great pleasure to be a part of this uh, uh, IIT PALS Industry Speaks uh, Digital Program. I really am very happy to meet you all in this virtual mode and extremely sorry that I could took a little bit time for me to join slightly late, delayed and actually once again uh, apologies for the same and uh, like it is very happy to note that IIT PALS is doing an excellent job especially uh, focusing on uplifting the technical education especially in Tamil Nadu region. It's a very great task that, uh, especially in South, that too in Tamil Nadu, cluster of institutions across the nook and corner of the state come and institutions are located and it's a great task being taken up. And uh, really all the participating institutions, partnership institutions are really getting uh, benefited out of it. I, out of their uh, various activities planned for the entire academy, one such activity today we have with us, the Honorable Speaker, Dr. Jay Ganesh, is there being with us to deliver his lecture on building and scaling enterprise, enterprise create machine learning system. Really, it's an excellent topic being chosen and we are having a, a eminent personality with us. So like being an academician for the past 30 years, that to my experience in NIT where we have allied students joining NITs and also have my stint, start stint at abroad where I could able to uh, I mean, uh, have experience in uh, teaching uh, international students. And the past 12 years before taking up my uh, current assignment at the SRM Institute, I had experience in two different institution, institutions as vice principal and a principal. Where it really, uh, day by day, a kind of experience, what I gained is uh, immense, I can say, because now the transformation, the gone are the days where actually we learn from the books and the faculty teaching and then uh, getting job and gaining experience on our own. Gone are the days. Now the technology is, I mean, taking a dramatic a change a day by day where it demands a lot of different kind of skill sets from the students. Especially in IT sector, it is actually at a very faster pace, the technology uh, changes and the buzzwords, newer buzzwords are coming. It's really being an academician, it's a challenge for us to train and prepare our students, especially to the industry needs. Where being at SRM Ramavaram, University Ramavaram campus, as on date, we have around 12,000 students who are pursuing their higher studies in engineering and technology streams, beyond which we have one institute called as SRM is very affiliated on the university. One dental institute we do have in our campus and on arts and science college put together, we can say around 18,000 students are there. It, that itself is a greater challenge, meeting their requirements day by day. And another thing that curriculum quite obvious that even though we enjoy autonomy, even uh, we have the freedom to uh, de design our work curriculum which is not sufficient to meet the industry requirements. Around 200 and odd industrial people are there, uh, actually uh, taking part in our board of studies. They contribute a lot in uh, designing our curriculum, despite that it is not much sufficient for us to meet out the pace at which the technology develops. So to do that, actually, we have strong tie up with lot number of industries every department is being actually advised encouraged to engage or sync sinking some and uh, mou with the various top-notch issues where they have interact with the students and that uh, send the students for internship nowadays the paradigm shift has taken place that means when placement through internship many of the companies are actually uh, started adopting that kind of uh, practice in recruiting students training them observing them 
and then observe them based on the talents. Now that trend is like that. In this scenario, actually, we really find a lot of time, but we do get a lot of good potential students across the nation, which is one of the major plus points where that we can comfortably groom them and uh, I mean, uh, mold them to the industrial requirements. So all along, actually, wherever possible, we do invite uh, the industry relationship because industry and industry institute need to go hand in hand, especially with innovative ideas, so many things. Many other students now just showing interest to come up with the startup, innovative ideas. For that also, we need to cater to the needs. Many of the students would like to pursue higher studies. For them also, the industry expectation and also the current trends based on that, they like to choose their own stream and also country. And especially our association with the PALS, which I cannot simply appreciate in few words, a lots and lots of activities being I mean, uh, planned, scheduled and executed in a highly efficient manner and time bound actually their dedication i think we need to learn from them so this is actually really happening because they play a vital role in bridging the gap between the industry and the institute which is very much essential in the current trend and also a lot of futuristic technologies are there and quite obvious that in the recent past some of the core departments are losing its fame because of the curriculum need to be revised periodically I think the PALS also will contribute in revising such a curriculum so that many takers normally what it used to be in those days, especially mechanical, civil, electrical, and core branches where others are actually emerged from these core streams, I can see. With this, I think this kind of industrial talk to our fraternity will really actually throw a lot of light where we need to think of where the gap is so that bridging the gap thought process would be given by the faculty and the entire top officials so that the curriculum is suitably revised, valued courses will be introduced so that bridging gap so the students are well trained during their course of program with us and then comfortably and confidently they can face the outside world. So with these words, once again, actually, I thank our management having permitted us to become a partner institution with IIT PALS from this academic year onwards. Actually, I just wonder and appreciate, I take this opportunity to appreciate the IIT PALS really an extreme, because in the previous institution, all the five years, I gained a lot, experienced a lot. That experience I'm now taking and giving to SRM. So I think this will continue a lot. And once again, I appreciate my thank our management, all the top officials for giving this permission and also the IIT Pulse organizers. And also the once again, thank the speaker for having accepted and being with us today. Once again, welcome you all for this program. And I'm sure that a lot of takeaway will be there by the audience for this today's program. With this, once again, thank you, Onodal. Thank you very much, sir, for your great words and support. Now I cordially invite the speaker of the day, Dr. Jay Ganesh, Senior Vice President at Head Emphasis Next Labs. Dr. Jay Ganesh is an award-winning digital transformation and innovation leader with expertise in leading technology strategy, organizational innovation, research and development, new product and service innovations. He has been recognized in the industry as an innovator with a proven track record of converting new technology ideas into successful business opportunities. He built several global award-winning products, services and solutions across areas such as social network analysis, predictive analytics, quantum computing, machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing, web accessibility and usability, and augmented reality. He is a prolific inventor with 15 granted patents and dozens of awards from renowned organizations. He is awarded with a PhD from Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, and an MBA. He is also a recipient of the Chemming Rolls-Royce Science and Innovation Fellowship at the University of Oxford. It gives us great honor to have you, sir. The stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and good afternoon, everyone. And um, and I thank for giving me the opportunity to present uh, to this audience. Thanks to PALS and thanks to all the participating colleges and um, students for uh, joining the session. 
Now, <clears throat> before I get into the details of the of the presentation, I'm sure uh, you must all be uh, wondering about all the interesting machine learning projects you are executing. You must be learning about uh, the basics of Python programming, data science. You, some of you could be programming in R or Scala or um, any of the other Java, for example, all those languages. You must be building these models at a very small scale. You must be experimenting with these models, testing the results and comparing the results and say, okay, I'm happy with what I got. And maybe you will do a GitHub commit or share you know, some of these with your friends. But have you wondered what it takes to build and deploy these models at scale in an enterprise? <clears throat> at scale, uh, by, by at scale, I mean um, hundreds or even hundreds of thousands of such models, which will solve various enterprise problems. So that is a challenge faced by enterprises, and that is a challenge which we are trying to solve. Uh, by you know by various means in terms of automation and various other techniques. So today's talk is all about that. Today's talk is about how can you build those uh, models, those uh, build those models at scale, deploy those models at scale, and of course uh, you know reap the benefits of on-time uh, deployment and importantly uh, you know the business decisions associated with it. Okay. So this is the talk, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what we what we will cover today is uh, a bit of this. We will give a very very a quick introduction to what the challenge is all about, what exactly it involves in tackling this challenge. I'm not getting into details about the basics of uh, AI and machine learning and deep learning that you can read about. Uh, you know, for those who are new to it. Though you can read about some of those things. There are enough and more courses available in various sources. I'm sure some of you are already doing, or many of you are already uh, programming, uh, uh, you know, building basic uh, machine learning models, some even advanced machine learning models. We'll talk about uh, machine learning lifecycle management. I spoke about uh, the machine learning being a long process of building. It is not just one model and deploy it because you need to you need to build it you need to test it you need to integrate it with the enterprise system you need to monitor it etc cetera, etc cetera. it's a pretty long process so you need to actually uh, be involved in each steps and try and automate each one of these steps so that you can do this repeatedly across many many different problem areas and development and deployment associated with it is very very critical because it is not enough if you just build it, you should be deployed in an enterprise scale scenario, and this model should be functioning and solving enterprise challenges on an ongoing and regular basis. We will talk about automation, what, how and where uh, we are bringing in automation across the entire machine learning and machine learning operations lifecycle, and give you some project examples also in terms of what we are doing uh, for some of our uh, customers. Very, very quick introduction. So this slide essentially talks about the explosion of machine readable content. So by machine readable content, it, it could be any content which can be read by uh, a machine and then take an action on it. It could be text, it could be video, it could be audio, it could be documents, emails, your tw Twitter messages, your Instagram photos which you publish on, uh, you know, between your friends, the YouTube videos you watch, the WhatsApp messages you spend uh, to send, the Facebook chats or Facebook content you share with your friend, the LinkedIn connections you establish, uh, the Netflix videos you watch, or uh, even the uh, you know the Amazon uh, you know video related content which you consume, or TikTok or Twitch, you name it. In sixty seconds, this is what happens. Uh, this, of course, this chart is repeated every year by some of these folks. They monitor what happens in an internet minute, right? So, um, you know, you know, typically, ex, uh, you know, exabytes of data, which is ten to the power of eighteen bytes of data of text, is uh, created and it is doubling every year, every year or two, right? And it is growing exponentially because. Uh, gone are the days, uh, you know, where we used to actually create content and purge it or delete it. I remember back in those days where uh, storage was expensive, 
after some time we used to delete the data or purge the data etc etc now nobody talks about purging the data we are already always talking about archiving the data for the future so that somewhere someone down the line can start using it for whatever purpose it's meant for so so if this is happening this is what happens in the internet minute in 60 seconds right this doesn't cover what happens in the corporate side of things it doesn't ha- cover what uh, happens in you know hundreds of thousands of factories across the world it doesn't capture all those sensors all those edge devices all those other cloud computing systems which support those factory machines at any any uh, at any point in time so orders of magnitude larger amounts of data is created from those systems it doesn't cover the data cover created by services industries it doesn't cover a lot of other data sets so put together this this number what happens in 60 minutes uh, in an internet 60 seconds in an internet time if you look at all the data created by all those entities across the world this will be orders of magnitude larger which means that this is an opportunity for someone with the right tools right techniques right algorithms right methodologies right models right frameworks etc to start analyzing this data making sense out of this data generate from all the systems and generate actionable insights from this data right as you know that data by itself has no use unless it is put to use uh, through an analytics framework you might have a long series of content which has been shared it could be a bunch of tweets or it could be uh, a number of facebook posts or it could be any of the other content you're talking about just having the data has you know it's got only have limited utility where the utility comes in is that if you're able to apply an algorithm for, to that text messages for example and let's say you can run a sentiment analysis algorithm to identify Uh, tweets about my company and say that you know 80% of all the tweets of all the people are talking about the company are positive and the 10% is negative or t- uh, and the rest 10% is neutral so you can do it if you have 10 tweets or 20 tweets or even 100 tweets what if there are 100000 tweets what do you have a million tweets how do you how do you make it automated can you have automated models which will go through all the tweets buy all the tweets in bulk have the firewalls access to all the twitter feeds or firewalls access to all the other uh, data sources you're talking about and then apply intelligence on top of it apply models on it apply algorithms and fine tune and build them into models and take important decisions saying that this set of customers are really unhappy with my services therefore i should do something about it or this group of customers are talking about need for a certain feature or functionality of a certain product i have can i uh, include that in my product roadmap and i can launch it 6 months down the line right so that is where the challenge really enterprises are faced with there is a deluge of information external data of the type you see here large amounts of internal data created by internal systems a lot of this uh, data there is hidden insights hidden nuggets of gold bars hidden there which you need to effectively efficiently and cost effectively and in a timely fashion extract and act on those information because they are very very critical for your business and believe me a lot of companies are already doing it so if you are not doing some of these uh, activities you can potentially be left behind by the competition so therefore all the more reason for you to it be aware of all this data sets available all this internal external data and act on it act on it at a very very large scale not just analyzing a small subsegment but analyzing a much larger data from a big data perspective right like i said so this data consists of content from web pages emails instant messages sms tweets etc etc so you know and this presents a, a very very uh, important opportunity for all the tools out there all the systems out there right an opportunity for computer in the loop to do a lot more right and and of course there is also the growing uh, you know role of languages in human computer interaction we'll talk about that 
as we progress because um, you know tools uh, like GP2, uh, GPT-3, GPT-2 are built on large language models and they leverage a lot of these conversations from these open data sets to learn what the people are talking about and therefore give you intelligent answers to questions you ask, right? So the industry is growing in a very, very interesting fashion. And I believe as, um, as students, as future professionals, you are in the right, uh, right place uh, because never ever uh, before in the industry are you, um, is life made so easy if you are a software engineer or a software developer or a data scientist or a data engineer? Because today you have access to a large, a very large uh, pool of high quality open source resources. You have open source data sets, open source algorithms, you name it. So essentially, even if you do not want to build your own models, you can think of reusing a lot of those models. There is large amounts of data sets available, right? So there are open data sets available and there is there are large, uh, you know, uh, avail uh, large uh, computing powers available at a very cheap rate or even, even for free. So from a, from a uh, career building point of view also, you're, you know, you, you should think of how can we actually build a career potentially of uh, working in enterprises or starting an enterprise uh, about uh, providing solutions to solve this problem of making sense out of large amounts of data. Right, and this this field is is been evolving in a very very interesting fashion. If you look at uh, you know uh, the the researchers and the companies they are working on it, they are uh, they are they are trying to look at very very lofty goals. For example, uh, you know how do you actually naturally understand languages? Right, for example. If somebody is speaking to you in English or Hindi or Tamil or Telugu or any of the languages, can you naturally understand that language and respond to you, that person in, um, in that language? Spoken dialogues, open domain question answering, right? So, you know, which is another challenging area. You should be able to ans ask any questions and answer, not just certain questions, but any question you should be able to ask and get a satisfactory answer. And these are challenges which are being solved or at least been attempted to be solved by uh, tools like GPT-3, et cetera. And there are, there are people who are also working on bi-directional translation, which essentially means that there is no interpreter in between. You, you talk in Tamil and the translated language is straight away your language of choice. So, you know, things like that are also uh, becoming extremely popular. And then of course, there are the other challenges which are considered mundane, but they were not mundane a few years back. They're considered mundane today because they've been fairly well solved, uh, not completely solved. Uh, identifying spam is one such challenge, right? So today, if you open your email boxes, be it Yahoo or Google or any of the other email systems that you use, you don't find a lot of uh, spam messages. Back in those days, I, I can remember 10 years back or 15 years back, we used to get a lot of spam messages. In fact, the real, content or the actual messages were very few and we had to really go through it very carefully to see what is spam and what is not spam. Today, the technology is mature so much that you find very little spam messages. Of course, you'll get the occasional mail from a Nigerian friend or one of those scams. Uh, you know, of course, they are written in such a fashion that those spam engines don't catch them. But many of the, many of the uh, you know, spam engines have become mature that you don't get those. Uh, anymore, not that, to, not to the amount, not to the volume you used to get earlier. Categorizing news stories is another challenge which has been solved from a text processing perspective. Finding and comparing product information on the web, you'll find a lot of crawlers and bots available who will crawl and get you competitive information in terms of uh, from various products. You can crawl and get all that information you want, and of course, things I gave some examples about sentiment analysis to a product, stocks, companies, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the, the, this, I just gave you some examples here on the slide, uh, mainly on the text processing side. But if you look at an extent, this, this set of challenges to other areas, uh, let's say video analytics or audio analytics or image analytics or any of the other challenges which are being attempted, they all, uh, are uh, trying to solve uh, various uh, various instances of those problems. It could be automated video analytics to identify if there is 
uh, a, a mishap in a factory or automated video analytics to identify a, between you know a million people walking on the train train station and identify if somebody is misbehaving somebody or if there is a criminal out there or uh, looking at audio patterns to identify uh, if there is a threat in, involved in some of those conversations. So technology is progressing in a very, very advanced fashion. Uh, and all this data which is coming in is being put to good use in terms of training those engines and of course, making important decisions uh, by these engines uh, so that you can actually solve business problems from enterprises. Now, I give you a few, I'll give you a few more examples of uh, the, uh, the, some of the important applications you see in today's business. Uh, I gave you the example of uh, spam detection. And the first set of problems are mostly solved. Spam detection is a good example of a problem which is being solved. Then there are problems like text categorization. For example, if you give me news articles, uh, from you know all headlines from today's Hindu or the Times of India, can you automatically categorize them as a sports headline or a business headline or a technology headline or one of the other categories? This is another problem which has been solved to a large extent by, by the industry. Then there are other challenges like parts of speech tagging in terms of looking at that sentence and identify and break it into its, its subcomponents and identify uh, what are the various tags uh, in that particular center. Named entity recognition is another, uh, you know, another mostly solved problem uh, where you look at the content in a in a text file and or in, by text I mean it could be text, it could be even video transcripts or any of these audio transcripts, etc. Uh, can you identify the person, organization, or location? These are the entity types typically, and can you classify them or identify those entities in a, in a sentence? And then of course, information extraction uh, from uh, a message, for example, can you look at a message and automatically populate your uh, calendar saying that this person is asking for a meeting at a certain point of time. And then there are a bunch of areas which are making good progress uh, you know, they are not yet completely solved problems. There are problems like, for example, sentiment analysis, right? So, you know, looking at hundred uh, or even thousands or even hundred thousands of conversational texts, it could be tweets, it could be any of the other texts you're talking about. Can you automatically classify them as positive sentiments or neutral sentiments or negative sentiments? Uh, this is a mostly solved problem, not completely solved because there can be sarcasm, there can be other types of uh, you know, text which is out there in headlines or with tweets. And people use a lot of English, Hindi, Tamil together in tweets. Very challenging for uh, models to identify if it's a positive or a negative uh, a tweet or negative text. And then there are other types of challenges out there which are difficult, but it is mostly solved if you use good quality English uh, to analyze uh, good quality text, if you're able to analyze good quality text. Then there are challenges like co-reference resolution, uh, word sense disambiguation or syntactic parsing or machine translation. These are all areas we are seeing very good progress and the industry is uh, you know, on a fast pace industry as well as the open source community is solving a number of these uh, problems at a very, very fast clip. Then there are, of course, the, the still difficult to solve problems. Semantic search is one such problem. Um, the second problem is natural question and answering. For example, you should be able to ask any question under the sun and you should be, the engine should be able to respond with a logical answer. So that is a, a big challenge. Then there are the textual interference and paraphrasing. Summarization is an interesting challenge and summarization is one of those areas we are also working in the lab, in my lab. In fact, we're working on a number of these areas we are listed here. Uh, summarization is an interesting challenge where if you're given um, a, a two-page document or a three-page document, can you write a well-written summary of that particular uh, you know, uh, document? So we have built uh, deep learning based models which will go through the text, learn from the text, and write uh, a one paragraph summary of what you find in three pages. Well written from an English perspective, you won't, many of the times you can't even make out summaries written by an automated 
machine learning model uh, as against a human written summary, right? So, so the, the and of course, then there are other things like discords and dialogues, et cetera, where it is still hard, uh, the industry and the academia and open source community are working together uh, to solve a number of these problems. Okay, so why why does uh, you know uh, why it is challenging to solve some of these problems? So, right? so the languages which we speak, the type of um, you know references we use, and various languages have various degrees of complexity. Uh, they have their own structures, they have linguistic structures behind that, etc., which sometimes um, are difficult for machines to understand. And it's difficult for humans to understand. Forget the machines to understand. English is one such language. So let me take this very, very simple sentence, right? Um, it says, I made her duck, right? So I made her duck is a sentence. So I it just forget this option, which I've given at the bottom. So if I say, I, I made her duck, you can interpret it as I cooked waterfall for her. Duck is a waterfall and somebody cooked duck for that particular person. Or I cooked waterfall belonging to her. Right, so she's got a duck and she gave me the duck and I took the duck for her. Um, I created the, the duck she owns. It's a plaster duck. It is not a, it's, a, it's not a flesh and blood duck. It is a toy. I made her a toy for her. So the next one could be, I caused her to quickly lower her head or body. For example, I threw a ball at her or threw something at her and she ducked down. And, uh, and therefore you can interpret, I made her duck in such a fashion or or even the ludicrous uh, i wave my magic wand and turn her into an undifferentiated waterfall right uh, i did some you know harry potter magic i uh, twilled my wand and made her human she became a duck right so you know if you look at the first four options you know it is very much possible that somebody has been told i made her duck and if you close your eyes you would possibly be associating this sentence with one of those options, right? So it is not easy for a machine to understand. It's easy for a human to understand. Imagine how difficult it is for the machine to understand. So these are the complexities you deal with when you understand text, when you understand images, when you understand videos, when you understand audio text, audio coming in from all the content we are talking about and analyzing that text and making important business decisions around this. Right. So, you know, these are the challenges you deal with if you are looking at data science as a career option, uh, you know, uh, going forward. Then there are then there is a syntactic ambiguity, semantic ambiguity, et cetera, et cetera. All the things you have to consider when you are building solutions for a problem of the type I'm talking about. If you look at this example of I made her done, there are several other industry examples, several other English sentences one can think of, which will have similar uh, complexity and it will throw the machine off uh, off uh, if it is trying to understand what that text is all about. Going further, so we'll come to the crux of the talk in terms of machine learning lifecycle management. So that is the talk about all about. And uh, then uh, what I will do is I'll talk you through the entire machine learning lifecycle from start to the uh, deployment. And then I'll talk about how do you actually automate this? How do you actually uh, build uh, machine learning models at scale by leveraging a number of these automated steps, which we will discuss uh, you know, uh, in the next few slides. This is a very, very interesting paper from people from Google, and they had written this paper. This screenshot is from one of those diagrams. So this paper talks about, uh, this, this diagram is about uh, machine learning debt. So you know, for those who are new to the concept of te technical debt, you read it up. You don't have the time to discuss it today. Um, machine learning, like other technologies, machine learning also result in technical debt, right? So if you look at machine learning models or code we are talking about, you know, the code which you built, the code which you have tested or deployed, that becomes that small black box out there uh, in the enterprise scenario. To make that small black box work by small uh, the size, you can equate that size to the effort you put or the cost involved, you know, you name it. All, all those characteristics can be associated with that small black box. But the key thing here, here is if you've got to make that black box work, you need to have all the other surrounding and associated gray and white boxes in place. So for example, 
you need to have a, an effective data collection mechanism. And we all know that in data science, data collection and cleaning and feature extraction and verification takes a significant amount of time from a developer perspective. So you need to have all those mechanisms in place. You need to have the analysis tools in place. You should have the, the serving infrastructure in place. You should have the monitoring tools in place, right? So for that, making that ML code, which is a small part which you build, it could be a sentiment analysis algorithm. It could be a topic extraction algorithm. It could be a quantum machine learning algorithm. It could be an anomaly detection algorithm. It could be any of the other things you can think about to make that thing work, you need to have all the supporting infrastructure in place, right? So, which is important because just having that black box won't give you the business benefits. You need to have all the associated paraphernalia to ensure that everything works seamlessly and most importantly, uh, you know, help enterprises uh, generate benefits out of this entire uh, uh, set of supporting and complementary tools and uh, and building blocks this is uh, this is the machine learning life cycle so if you look at the you know the way to look at this is i'm i'm sorry i, I just switched off the animation for this otherwise this would have been animating one after the other but to read this this diagram just read from left to right on the extreme left you have the data coming in from various sources and we spoke about the various data types in the beginning and they are, of course, B2C scenarios, but I also spoke about enterprise data coming in from various systems. So they, those data could be sales data, it could be data coming in from databases, Excel sheets, Word documents, um, you know, social data, code from the, you know, uh, from whatever code you have written in the past, and dialogues, conversations, etc. Typically, the first task in machine learning and is in terms of um, labeling the data, right? So it's essentially an extremely manual process. Right. So if you, you must have all been wondering uh, what is labeling all about, labeling is all about uh, you know, telling the engine to differentiate between two different, uh, you know, uh, two different contrasting or two different or n different types of options given to the engine to choose from. For example, if you are, uh, uh, if you are shown a cat and a dog and uh, as a human being, if you are told to differentiate, you know that you know, what is looking like a cat is a cat, the other one is a dog. If you, and this can be done by, you know, you know, even a kid, because they know and by, they have been tuned and trained uh, by various, um, you know, factors, uh, which essentially they have learned over a period of time, but a machine doesn't know what is what. So, for example, if you're looking at uh, building an image analytics algorithm, which is differentiating between cats and dogs. You need to, you need to provide the machine with enough images and pictures of dogs and cats and tag them as dogs and cats so that the engine learns from all the pixels in those images and uh, it is able to give you using deep learning an uh, outcome that says this set of images which has got these characteristics belong to dogs and this set of the other set of images which belong to uh, which has got a different set of characteristics belong to cats so you use that and, and tagging is an extremely human uh, intensive process so you need to have people sit and tag every single image, right? And this is this is part of life in you know, all machine learning projects. Uh, for all the su a supervised machine learning project, which becomes which which constitutes a large part of the projects we do. Then there are the unsupervised where you don't need tagging, but a significant number of projects we do are supervised, and you need to tag, um, you know, images or text or video or audio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you know, for every uh, you know every kilometer an autonomous car drives. Uh, typically nine to 10 hours of data which is captured from the car is used by a large backend team whose only job is to tag what the car's video has captured. It says that, okay, there is another car here, there's human walking, a dog out there, or a stop sign on the door, road, et cetera, et cetera. So the labeling part is an extremely critical activity in this entire process, and a lot of the labeling is done manually. Once the labeling is done, you go through the, the data cleaning and the data pre-processing steps, which is about data imputation, extraction, cleaning itself, wrangling, OCR, feature engineering, et cetera, which is all about making sure that the data which is coming in, the data which is coming in uh, from all the sources are cleaned and they are ready for consumption and ready for model building and deployment, right? Once a model is 
once the data is cleaned up, you go through the training cycle, which is about model building, development, feature identification, feature selection. You optimize the model, extremely iterative process. You'll have several groups of people working together, sometimes distributed, they're not in the same place. Sometimes you have distributed across different countries. Uh, when you have uh, you know larger teams where they work on one part of the problem, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially it's a very, very collaborative activity. Once you reach a certain level of model accuracy you're looking at, you look at validation and then you use the test data and you expose it, uh, the model which has been built to a model testing process, which is nothing but exposing the model to a new data set, which is, which is not seen. Um, and then once everything is ready, when you're happy with the results, either you're happy with the results and not happy, if you're not happy with the results, then you go through the entire process again. Now, at this point of time, you do system integration, which is nothing but integrating this entire model with an enterprise business scenario where you go live, when you go uh, when, you, when you go production scale. And at that time, what you're exposing that model is to, what you're doing is you're exposing that model to all the unseen new real life data, which is coming in from all the systems. So, so, for example, all the data which you spoke about differentiating between cats and dogs or sentiment analysis or topic extraction or translation models, et cetera, you're exposing that model to real life, completely unseen data coming in from various systems or sources or human beings. And the model is starting to perform in real life and taking important decisions. And those decisions could be any of the type I spoke about. It could be uh, even approving somebody's loan or rejecting somebody's loan or saying this set of sentiments are positive, this set is negative, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, taking important decisions and telling the human at the end, saying these are, uh, you know, what I think are uh, either positive tweets or negative tweets or cats versus dogs versus topics versus any of the other things you spoke about, namely digital recognition, et cetera. At this point of time, you essentially subject that particular model to a whole bunch of uh, checks, right? For example, there is a lot of controversy in various parts of the world in terms of the models taking the wrong decisions. They're taking decisions which are essentially biased in nature to certain races, certain set of people. Uh, and they are, again, um, you know, uh, they are faced with the challenge of explainability. They are not able to explain why they took a certain decision. So, uh, you know, a lot of government entities, enterprises are all um, um, questioning the efficacy of the machine learning models or uh, the, the decisions made by the uh, machine learning models because some of them, some of these decisions are not, um, you know, in favor or supporting the fundamental uh, human equality uh, premise of many constitutions, which means that the models need to be uh, checked, uh, validated, uh, retrained, exposed to new data at regular intervals. So it's an iterative cycle. So you look at model explanation, you monitor the models, you audit the models, you, the auditing is nothing but going uh, to every single model instance, you've done the experiment and finding out who, who took that decision, why that decision was made, which are variables you picked up for that model, which are the variables you ignored, you didn't include for the model, why did you do that? So all those notes and all those decisions are captured. And you also do the model behavior tracking because uh, which is an important thing because uh, you know imagine a scenario and model which was built, let's say two and a half years back, pre-COVID, right? Let us, uh, you know, let us say, I'll give you an example of a credit card fraud analytics model, which was built pre-COVID where the model was mainly customized for uh, identifying credit card fraud uh, for offline transactions, right? It's just a hypothetical scenario. There's no such model like that. Uh, it could be a model which is combined both offline and on online. For, for this discussion, let's assume that we have built a model which is uh, capturing a whole bunch of parameters from a physical uh, credit card transaction perspective, including the user who swiped the card, the location, the value of the money, the item they bought, the time of the day they bought, the city or the location from they bought, etc. Um, so, and then you build a model saying that you know if uh, this particular person spends most of the time in Bangalore, and um, and suddenly he is uh, swiping his his or her card from let's say Russia or Germany or some other country at a very odd time in the day or the night, uh, at a very high value transaction or a transaction in a suspicious website. 
right? And which means that, you know, uh, suspicious location, uh, which means that that could be a fraudulent transaction. Now, cut to the chase today. With those days, a lot of the transactions were predominantly physical. And that means you go to a shop and swipe the card and some of it will be online. But post-COVID, it is changed or reversed. I mean, a lot of transactions that are online. So all the models, all the training which you did earlier for an offline credit card fraud won't work today because the model, the, the data has changed. Uh, the human behavior has changed. People are buying things differently. They're buying different things. Right, so which means that the model which has been trained on a certain data set two years down the line will not work on today, where everything is changed, the world has changed, and this 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 COVID is an extreme scenario, right? Uh, because you can actually see a palpable change. But if you look at the other uh, nuances, there are micro changes happening all the time. There are user behaviors changing. Maybe it is not very express like COVID, but they are changing. Uh, the data is changing, user behaviors are changing. Therefore, the model needs to be trained regularly. So you, you identify drift. We call it data drift or model drift. Um, so once a drift is identified, again, there are automated mechanisms to identify drift. And once a drift is identified, you go through the entire cycle again. You go back, you do the machine learning development, all the steps I spoke about, and deploy the model and continue this process. Mm -hmm. You, how, how frequently do you do it? It depends upon uh, the type of industry you are in. There could be some industries who are prone for a lot of change in a very short duration. Uh, there you need to have regular uh, enough model retraining and this entire activities repeated at regular intervals. It could be every three months, it could be a month, it could even be weeks. Or there could be industries where the pace of change is very slow, where you can possibly do that every six months or every year for that matter. And, uh, but basically the whole thing is this set of activities that you see here on this particular slide needs to be repeated. It needs to be repeated on a regular basis, right? So unless you automate a lot of these steps, you essentially spend a lot of useless time and effort and energy in doing this on a repeated fashion. And this is where ML ops comes in, which is all about automating a lot of the steps which you see from the machine learning development and deployment perspective. So what you're trying to do through MLOps is try and automate as much as possible. Build the reusable components, build uh, automated drift detection modules, build automated, um, you know, um, automated uh, data imputation mechanisms, automated feature engineering approaches, provide the very rich collaboration mechanisms, build feature stores so that you can share the features, build by other teams, et cetera. So this is where the challenge here is, can you automate as much of this so that the enterprise need not wait for a long period of time to get the models and deploy the models and get the benefits out of the models? You can go at a very, very regular pace. You can quickly turn it around and start uh, you know, deploying these models and take important business decisions. Now, if you look at typical machine learning projects, these are the four types of people who are you'll find them to be involved. The first person is someone called a data scientist, right? So the data scientist is responsible for building machine learning models and generating insights from data. So this is a person who's essentially uh, looking at data sets. So she is uh, essentially building machine learning models. She's looking at Python or R code, et cetera. And she also uses data science platforms. The second category of uh, people who work on such projects are the data engineers. The data engineers are responsible for uh, procuring the data, right? Extracting the data from various disparate systems, challenging job in terms of getting all the data, cleaning up the data, because data is never clean. It's always missing data, uh, jumbled up data, you know, multiple variables mixed together, all those challenges exist. So this, they have a challenge of in terms of cleaning up the data and making the data available to the data scientists, right? So they come in before the data scientists. So they typically work with cloud platforms, big data platforms, et cetera. Then you have the machine learning engineer. So the machine learning engineer's job is to essentially automate the CI/CD pipeline, um, the continuous integration and continuous development pipeline. So his or her job essentially is to have, uh, you know, standardized pipelines from model uh, building to production 
And they typically work on tools like Kubernetes or Docker or Git or Git Actions. They are responsible for all the Git pushing the model to the Git, testing it, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, you have the data science manager whose responsibility is to essentially translate all the work done by all the people I spoke about, uh, translate that them into business decisions. So he or she acts as the interface with the business users and translate what the business users want through the models built by the teams, which we see here, and make them available uh, to the business decision makers, either in the form of dashboards or in the form of matrices or in the form of any of the other reports uh, or decision matrices the business wants, right? And these personas need to work together extremely closely, extremely collaboratively, because the data engineer comes first in terms of cleaning up the data, the data scientist comes next in terms of building the models, and then you have the CI/CD pipeline managed by the machine learning engineer. So all these personas, and then of course the business manager, data science manager, who is interfacing with the business teams. All these four personas need to work very, very seamlessly together uh, for effective machine learning uh, team in an enterprise. Now, if you look at the various tools available out there, like I said, there are open source tools, there are commercial tools, there are tons of tools available in the market, right? So you must have seen many of them or used many of them. If not, I would encourage you to look at a lot of these open source tools. There are uh, you know, several of them available and several of the logos out here are all open source tools. Uh, I'll encourage a lot of you to uh, look at the platforms or the tools available or the workflows available, et cetera, et cetera, and libraries, et cetera. So, so if you are looking at a career from a machine learning, um, perspective, either a data scientist or a machine learning engineer or a data engineer, you probably need to be getting comfortable with some of these. I'm not saying all of them, but you should be comfortable first, of course, with the basics. Uh, and then, of course, you should, you should be comfortable with some of these tools so that you can start, uh, you know, implementing this once you start your career with some of those uh, you know, companies, because you will be faced with using some of these tools as part of your life. Python is an important language. Um, so, you know, most of the data science development happens in Python. So I would encourage you, if you're looking at a career in data science, to strongly pick up Python, because there are no two ways about it. If you're a data scientist, you should be knowing Python, because most of the development happens in Python. Okay. So let's come to the next section in the talk, which is about automating uh, you know, the entire machine learning life cycle. So auto ML, uh, there, is, uh, there is a topic, and I believe one of the things is gonna talk about, um, you know, see auto, uh, auto ML systems automatically determines the approach, right? That performs best for the application, right? So if you are looking at saving time and effort and energy, and you leave the machine to take the decisions, auto ML is a very, very good approach, right? Because many of the times, you know, uh, data scientists do not want to understand the underlying black box technologies behind it. They just want to, uh, they just know that this is the results they're looking for. Let me use auto ML based approaches for doing a lot of these activities, right? So auto ML comes into place there. It's a very, very useful set of tools, and there are various, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, components available in AutoML. The key benefits of leveraging AutoML, and we, we leverage this extensively, is that beyond all the traditional model creation, right? You have all the data pre-processing, meta learning, feature learning, model searching, data acquisition and re uh, reporting, workflow generation. A lot of these activities are involved. In there, AutoML can help you in simplifying your tasks. There are a number of key benefits. It increases the efficiency and throughput because I spoke about all the manual steps above. AutoML can do a lot of them with the click of a button. Now it becomes life easier and much more efficient. It lowers the level of expertise required for doing machine learning because many of the times you don't have data scientists with an extreme degree of expertise who know and you can explain all the algorithms and the models. So in some cases, you may not know everything, but at the same time, you want to solve the problem. So you know, AutoML helps you because uh, some of those challenges can be solved uh, by AutoML without even unknowing underlying what the technology is. For example, if you want to drive a car and go from point A to point B, you need not know the underlying internal combustion engine. You just need to know that if I press the accelerator, the brake and the clutch, and the vehicle will reach me from point A to point B in uh, five minutes or 10 minutes, right? It's as simple as that. 
So, you know, there are key challenges. There can be uh, overfitting related challenges. There could be computational challenges, et cetera. But AutoML is one of those promising uh, technology components they use in many of the machine learning operations lifecycle projects. Then there are the, the AutoML usage in data engineering. I spoke about the previous one is AutoML in data sciences. Science, you, you definitely use AutoML for data engineering. I spoke about the data quality checks because these are exhaustive data quality checks you need to do because like I said, data is always messy. You'll never get the perfect data for you to work on. They could be missing data imputation. They could be uh, insufficient data. They could be biased data. You know, you name it. All the challenges come together when you have some of those data models in place. Then you need to do the quality checks. You need to do the profiling of the data. You need to do imputation. You need to do augmentation in many cases. You need to, of course, do feature engineering and feature source. And AutoML can help you in a lot of these activities, right? So AutoML is not a magic wand. At the same time, it can help you accelerate um, the, the pace and uh, uh, you know the pace of the task which you do because it is it is built with certain features and functionalities which can or which can do a lot of these things with the click of a button. So the next one is about uh, I'll skip this. Yeah. So the interesting concept which I want to talk about is a transfer learning, right? So transfer learning is a very very interesting problem, interesting uh, solution to a problem I spoke about, um, you know, the cats versus dog examples. Uh, the ch you know, let's say that you have created uh, a model which can differentiate between cats and dogs. Can I use the learning from that model which are built to differentiate between cats and dogs to differentiate between, let's say, buffaloes and cows, right? So the transfer learning is, is all about uh, you know, uh, understanding and learning from one domain or one set of problems you have solved and, and apply that with, of course, some modifications and changes to another domain and, and solve the same problem. Why do we need to do transfer learning? We, we recommend transfer learning because, like I said at the beginning, training time requires uh, time and uh, money, right? Every time you have to do the training, you have to do the labeling in many cases. So it's a time consuming process, extremely expensive process. Uh, so, you know, can you uh, look at the embeddings and of course training to the last layer? So you essentially look at so, some supervised learning or even supervised approaches. So if you look at a label data set and can you essentially use transfer learning and, and, and Transfer learning is a very, very interesting concept, very, very promising concept where, uh, you know, which is growing very, very, very uh, fast because, you know, you don't want to, you want to reuse as much as possible the models across various domains and transfer learning helps you in a lot of these activities. So the next one is about uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment for machine learning deployments. I spoke about the machine learning engineer who does this entire pipeline management so his or her job is to essentially make sure that all the models which are built by the data scientists are deployed, they are version controlled, they uh, essentially run all the pre-processing scripts, all the model training scripts, because once you've done it, you might want to do it in a repeated fashion. So the machine learning engineer's job is to essentially uh, build this entire, all the steps uh, for this entire model building and deployment cycle. Uh, and essentially run this on a regular basis because you need to you need to do containerization, you need to do automated scripts, uh, you need to deploy this in Git. You used to have used to uh, use Git actions in some cases because every time it is time consuming to push your content to Git. Uh, so the CI/CD pipeline is is a never ending, always on pipeline, which is repeated on a regular fashion uh, by the CI/CD engineers who do this. Uh, on a regular basis, which is an important step because the, the journey doesn't end once the model is built. The journey, in fact, never ends, but part of the journey ends once it is deployed and the models start giving you the results in, in real life scenarios. Then there are challenges with respect to drift detection. I spoke about once the model is deployed uh, and um, once the model starts functioning, after four months or five months, people forget there is a machine learning model and start taking actions based on the recommendations of the machine learning models. And after some time, they realize that what the model is telling you is quite different 
from what uh, it is. Uh, and they start blaming the models because uh, they're saying that, you know, the machine learning model is wrong. And then they say the AI is wrong and the AI is not good, et cetera, et cetera. Now, many of the times the problem lies not with the model. The problem lies the fact that you have forgotten or you're not done retraining uh, on a regular basis, which means that the model is still taking decisions on uh, the training data set, which was exposed, which it was exposed to six months back. Whereas the user behavior, consumer behavior, data behavior is changed. The data has drifted. The user behavior is changed. So it is important to have this entire drift mechanism in place and continuously check for drift. Uh, you do this on a regular basis. You, there are automated mechanisms for drift checking and drift identification. So when you identify drift, it could be numerical data, it could be textual data. Once you identify drift, you can essentially set an alert to the uh, you know to the data science team saying that uh, certain thresholds are being breached from a drift perspective. You might want to relook at it, uh, relook at it uh, completely. So which means that you need to retrain. Uh, for the new data set and then redeploy so that the model start functioning to the level of standard you expect it to function. So I spoke about the entire MLOps uh, cycle, MLOps, just to reiterate what MLOps is all about. Uh, MLOps is, is, uh, is a, it's nothing but machine learning uh, and IT operations combined, right? So essentially it automates, it, it focuses on automating and productionizing machine learning algorithms. The idea here is that you need to have machine learning algorithms at scale uh, and you need to bring them at scale to businesses to take important decisions. So MLOps lets you do that. It lets you do that through enhanced collaboration and communication between data scientists and information technology professionals. So a lot of the activities I spoke about in terms of uh, automation, collaboration, drift modeling, uh, et cetera, goes into making this entire MLOps cycle successful and collaboration effective between the various stakeholders in the entire machine learning life cycle. Benefits typically you find in MLOps include speed and time to market, which is very, very important because when you are looking at hundreds of models or thousands of models, uh, there is no way you can manually do every single one of them. So it definitely improves the speed and time to market. Extreme, extreme degree of efficiency is brought about. Explainability is inbuilt because you need to not just deploy a model and but also explain why the model is taking an important decision. Then there is uh, ele uh, elements of automation. I spoke about auto ML, uh, automated drift check, automated feature engineering, and a lot of the automation is built into ML ops. Extreme degree of collaboration is important because in large organization, distributed organization, you'll find several data science teams. You need to bring them together on the same project or of course, uh, bring together the learnings between different projects to feature stores, et cetera. Then you have to have uh, monitoring mechanisms, cost of development to be under control. And of course, important from a governance and compliance perspective, because uh, the government agencies are always monitoring what you're doing, because for whatever reasons, if you're rejecting loans for a certain set of people, you can be questioned in the future. So if that compliance issue comes in, you should be able to explain to the agencies why the model take a, took a certain decision which it took, right? And therefore governance becomes a very, very important aspect. Now, a couple, uh, one, uh, one slide and I'll end this, uh, this discussion and open up for Q&A. Uh, while we speak about all of them, uh, we are seeing a very, very interesting trend. I spoke about automated model building and development deployment, et cetera. So those who are following this trend around GPT-3, so this is one of those uh, discussion points here, right? Um, you know, people are saying, uh, you know, there's a new type of AI coming up, they call la large language models. And this person is tweeted that he just used GPT-3 to generate code for a machine learning model just by describing the data set and the required output, right? So this is a new trend which, which is emerging and coming up, which is called no code AI or a low code AI where you are not coding everything by hand. You are essentially using very, very advanced large language models or large language uh, uh, models from text or audio or images, et cetera, to, to, to do natural language processing, to do even writing code, right? We are, nevertheless, we are in for interesting times. Uh, it's, it's a great career opportunity because this is an area where the industry is going to go uh, very, very aggressively, you will find a lot more projects and a very, very rewarding career 
because this is something you're you're seeing accelerated investments from across the world. I I, I stop my uh, presentation and that is pretty much what I had to present my, from my side. Open for Q and A, and I'll be able to answer any questions you have. Over to the PALS team and the organizers. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, Ram, sir? Uh, yes, Robin. You want uh, to pick something? No, I think uh, yes. um, next we have to quickly administer the flash quiz. And then the student's presentation has to be kept, you know, precise so that we can, you know, uh, finish on time. Yeah, you can proceed, Robin. Okay. Yeah, that uh, participants, I have pasted the Slido quiz link in the chat box uh, in Zoom as well as YouTube also. So please uh, click the link and register your email ID and the name. Then we will go, I will give one minute to register it, then we will go for the quiz. Then I will share my screen. Ram sir, are you able to view my screen? Yes, I am able to view. Yes, yes, yes. I request the participants, yes, to join the quiz. We have 26, 33, around 300 participants are there. So I request all the participants to join the quiz. So it is a very, only five questions. The questions will be uh, from your uh, uh, session uh, handled by Dr. Uh, Jay Ganesh. Ram sir, shall we start? It is crossed to 100. Ah, Robin, you proceed. You can proceed yeah. as usual. Yeah, yeah. Okay, your first question, you have a 20 seconds. So what is machine learning? You have a 20 seconds. So please answer the four options are available. So please answer it. Let's see around. Let's see. So answer D is the right uh, around 33 percentage. We'll go to the next one. Machine learning algorithms build a model based on sample data known as. Let's see the answer. Answer E. The next question Machine learning is a subset of Dash. You have 20 seconds. So, The answer. answer is B. Next question. Real-time decisions, game AI, learning, task, skill acquisition, and robot navigation or applications of Dash. 14, 13, 12. 
Let's see the answer. Answer is A. The final question real world machine learning use cases are this is a digital assistance chatbot sort detection all of the world. Yes, let's see the answer. Answer D. So, so take the photograph. So, uh, first, that is Sanjita, Manivanan, Akshita, Lavan, Bhavya, and Vishwita. So, thanks. Uh, congratulations to the participants. You can take the photograph. Okay. Thank you. Ram, sir, it is done. I will stop share my screen. Okay. Okay. I request uh, Siva Priya. Yes, sir. To okay, take care of this. Yes, Thank you, participants, for your response to the quiz. So it's now time to call upon the teams for their presentations. The student teams are asked to keep their presentations very precise. First, we have student team from SRM ISD Ramapuram who will be presenting on the topic MLOps and Machine Learning Lifecycle, followed by Velalar College of Engineering and Technology. Over to you, SRM student team. Uh, CNC? Yes, I'm back. Yeah. Uh, you can. No, I unmuted. Okay, fine. Yeah, sir. I'm good. Thank now. you for this opportunity. May I know that my, is my screen visible, sir? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah, sir, thank you so much, sir. Hello, everyone. And this is Narayan from Mesaram Ramapuram. And we are here as a group to present on the topic MLOps and machine learning life cycle. Now, coming to the question what is MLOps? Machine learning operations are is the discipline of delivering machine learning models to repeatable and efficient workflows. MLOps includes all the capabilities that data science product teams and IT need to deploy, operate, govern, and secure models in production. MLOps includes three main components. They are machine learning, DevOps, and data engineering. Now let me see a brief about all the three. What is machine learning? Author Samuel coined the term machine learning in the year 1959. He was a pioneer in artificial intelligence and computer gaming and defined machine learning as the field of study that gives computers that capability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Thus, machine learning is an application of artificial intelligence. It gives devices the ability to learn from their experiences and improve their self without doing any coding. What is DevOps? It is an acronym used for the combination of development and operations that encourages collaborative application development and IT operations in an organization. DevOps is a collection of tools, practices, and philosophies used in an organization to increase its efficiency and effectiveness. Moving on to data engineering. Data engineering is the complex task of making raw data usable to data scientists and groups within an organization. In addition to making data accessible, data engineers create raw data analysis to provide predictive models and show trends for short and long term. Thus, without data engineering, it would be impossible to make sense of huge amounts of data that are available to businesses. Now, let me call upon Dacha Ine to explain about the principle of MLOps. Uh, principles of MLOps. So there could be more principles, but these are the most important principles and they, they are listed in the upcoming two PPTs. So the complete ML development pipeline includes the three levels where changes can occur. That is in terms of data, machine learning model and code. So all of these principles are based on these three changes. So the first one is automation. The object of an MLOps team is to automate the deployment of ML models into the core software system or as a service component. And this enables fast fixing of errors and learning from mistakes. Next one is continuous everything that is continuous X. It is actually a sequence of actions that a system applies to the data between its destination and source. It includes the following practices, continuous integration, deployment, testing, and monitoring. The next one is versioning. The, co the goal of versioning is to treat ML training scripts, ML models, and data sets for model training as the first class citizens in DevOps processors by tracking ML models and data sets with version control systems. The next one is experiment tracking. It is focused on collecting, organizing, and tracking model training information across multiple runs with different configurations. 
testing testing an ml system involves model validation model training etc monitoring here models is uh, more uh, models in a production summary statistics of the data need to be monitored so monitoring assures that the ml model performs as expected reproducibility it means that every phase of either data processing ml model training should produce identical results given the same input and this is this basically ensures uniformity in delivery and yet and setting a production standard and further on the core aspects and the iterative process will be continued by sanjita MLOps follows a process which combines both iterative and incremental development methodologies. This means the process is broken down into small portions with improvements made in each passing step. The development activities are repeated until the optimal results are achieved. This process has three phases in which the model is designed, trained, and deployed. The first phase involves understanding the user requirements and the data and designing an ML model to solve the problem. In the second phase, the applicability of the model is verified through methods like data engineering, ML model engineering, and testing and validation methods. The final phase of deployment focuses on delivering the model by using practices such as versioning, continuous delivery, and monitoring. Now moving on to the core aspects of MLOps. In recent times, MLOps has evolved and become into a machine learning lifecycle management approach rather than just being a set of practices. It assists in making the development of ML models more reliable by defining the processes involved. The core aspects of MLOps include various methods to manage the ML-based development lifecycle. It also supports various versions of the model, monitors and manages the model, provides governance and access control, in addition to model registries and catalogs for models developed in the same ecosystem. It also provides cloud-native security features to protect the models from being corrupted. Next, Akshita will be listing out the tools used for MLOps, followed by the machine learning lifecycle. So, the various loop, uh, various tools for MLOps such as Cloudera, TensorFlow, DataRobot, Dot Data, MLflow, iMerit, Cuberflow, Spark, Payment, etc., have been listed. Now, we will uh, see what is machine learning lifecycle and what are the various steps involved in it. We know that machine learning has taught the computer system to automatically learn without being explicitly programmed. The machine learning lifecycle is a cyclic process to build an efficient machine learning project. The main purpose of the lifecycle is to find a solution to the problem or a project. Machine learning lifecycle involves seven major steps. They are gathering data, data preparation, data wrangling, analyzing the data, training the data model, testing the model, and deployment. Now let's see each phase of the lifecycle in detail. Data gathering is the first step of the machine learning lifecycle. The goal of this step is to identify and obtain all the data-related problems. In this step, we need to identify the different data sources as data can be collected from various sources such as files, database, internet, or mobile devices. It is one of the most important steps of the life cycle. The quantity and quality of the collected data will determine the efficiency of the output. The more will be the data, the more accurate will be the pred prediction. After performing this step, we get a coherent set of data known as the data set. It will be used in further steps. So now, after collecting the data, we need to prepare it for further step. Data preparation is a step uh, where we put our data into a suitable place and prepare it to use in our machine learning training. This step can be further divided into two processes, uh, data exploration and data pre-processing. Data exploration is used to understand the nature of the data that we have to work with. We need to understand the characteristic format quality of data. A better understanding of data leads to an effective outcome. In this, we find correlation, general trends, and outliers. After data exploration, we will pre-process the data for its analysis. So the third step of machine learning lifecycle is data wrangling. Data wrangling is a process of cleaning and converting raw data into usable format. In real world application, collected data may have various issues, including missing values, duplicate data, invalid data, and noisy data. So we use uh, various filtering techniques to clean the data. It is mandatory to detect and remove all these issues before moving to the next step, as it can negatively affect the quality of the outcome. It is one of the most important steps of the complete process. Cleaning of data is required to address the quality issue. Now, further four steps of MLOP lifecycle will be explained by Sarah. Data analysis. Now the cleaned and prepared data is passed on to the analysis step. This step involves selection of analytical techniques, building models, and reviewing the result. 
The aim of this step is to build a machine learning model to analyze the data using various analytical techniques and review the outcome. It starts with the determination of the type of problems where we select the machine learning techniques such as classification, regression, cluster analysis, association, etc. Then build the model using prepared data and evaluate the model. The next step is model training. Model training is the key step in machine learning that results in model ready to be validated, tested and deployed. The performance of the model determines the quality of the applications that are built using it. Quality of the training data and the training algorithm are both important assets during the model training phase. Typically, training data is split for training, validation and testing. The training algorithm is chosen based on the end use case. 80% of the data set is used for training. The next step is model testing. The trained model test. The trained model is then tested to check the performance. The accuracy of the model is measured in this phase. The remaining 20% of the data set is used for testing. To compare models, a set of metrics are defined. So depending on the problem working on, the set of metrics will be different. For example, regression problems are used usually look at MSE, mean squared error, or MAE, mean absolute error. To evaluate a classification model, on the other hand, accuracy might be a good choice for a balanced data set. Imbalanced sets require more sophisticated metrics. F1 score is a good metric for such cases. Evaluation during training is performed on a separate validated validation data set. It tracks how good our model is at generalization, avoiding possible bias and overfitting. The next step is deployment. This is the last step of machine learning lifecycle where we deploy the model in the real world system. If the model is pro producing an accurate result as per the requirement with acceptable speed, then the model is ready to be deployed in the real system. But before deploying the project, we will check whether it's improving its performance using available data or not. The deployment phase is similar to making the final report of a project. So that's it about machine learning lifecycle. Now moving on to the working of MLOps by Dachani. Working of MLOps. To adopt MLOps, there are three levels of automation. So first one is manual process, and then the pipeline automation, and then the CA or CD or pipeline automation. So the first one, manual process. This is a, a typical data science process, which is performed at the beginning of implementing the machine learning. So this level has an experimental and iterative nature, and every step in each pipeline, such as data preparation and validation, are executed manually. The common way to process is to use rapid application development tools such as Jupyter Notebooks. The challenge is that in practice, models often break when they are deployed in the real world. To address the challenges of this manual process, it's good to use MLOps practices for CA or CD and continuous training. So this further on leads to level two and level three. Level two, so the pipeline automation and the goal of MLOps level two is to perform continuous training of the model by automating the ML pipeline. This level includes the execution of model training automatically where the continuous training of the model is introduced. Whenever new data is available, the process of model retraining is triggered. The challenge is that this setup is suitable when you deploy new models based on new data rather than on new ML ideas. So if you are able to manage many ML pipelines in production, then we need a CA or CD setup to automate the ML pipeline. So this leads to level three, that is CA or CD pipeline automation, and that will be explained by Sanjita. Third and final level is the CA CD pipeline automation. This level is implemented to perform rapid and reliable deployment of ML models to production. This system allows the data scientists to explore novel ideas around feature engineering, model architecture, and hyperparameters. The major difference from the previous stage is that here, the practices of building, testing, deploying the data, the ML model, and the ML training pipeline components are also automated. The pipeline can be divided into six stages, namely development and experimentation, continuous integration, continuous delivery of pipeline, automated triggering, continuous delivery of model, and model monitoring. Now let's look into the benefits of MLOps. Implementing MLOps can have various benefits. Some of them include reduced time on data collection and preparation, rapid validation process, effective management of the entire ML life cycle, easy deployment of high precision models, efficient scalability, integration and tracking. It also enables automated testing of ML practices and creation of reproducible workflows and models. And with this, we conclude our presentation. Thank you for providing us with this opportunity.
Thank you, team, for all your inputs and information. Now I call upon the student team from Velalar College of Engineering and Technology to present on their topic. Good evening, one and all present here. Myself, Ravi Silva from Velalar College of Engineering and Technology, Department of Information Technology. Our topic is Auto ML for Automated Machine Learning. First, we saw about machine learning. Machine learning is a method of data analyzing that automates analytical model building. A branch of artificial intelligence based upon the idea that system can learn from the data, identify the pattern and make the decision with minimal human intervention. Like uh, speech recognition. Machine learning can translate the speech into the text. Certain software application can convert it like voice and re record speech into the text file. Example, voice search. Next, deep learning. Deep learning is the type of machine learning and artificial it indicates the way of human gain certain type of knowledge. While traditional machine learning algorithm are linear, deep learning algorithm are stacked into a hierarchical and increasing complexity and abstraction. For example, product feedback. We are giving the feedback to the product poorly and a single star means Next time, the recommended machine recommended to the product over to the customer. But if we give good feedback to the product and a star fire rate means next time it recommended good product to the customer. Next, auto ML. Auto ML training a machine learning model with the sample data. Automated machine learning is a process of automating a task applying machine learning to real world problems. For example, our Daily life, we are using online shopping. The customer, two or three customers buying power bank along with the USB cable, means machine learning with that automatically next customer buying power bank, uh, it recommended along USB cable. Next, continue by Viknesh. Now we can see the methods and algorithms for the treatment methods and algorithms for the auto ML for the automated machine learning. There are the several methods and algorithms for the auto ML. Now we can see the frequently used few methods for the auto ML. There are the uh, first one is a hyperparameter optimization. Next one is a neural architecture search. Next one is a meta learning. First one is a hyperparameter optimization. It is a machine learning algorithm. It is used to find the hyperparameters that deliver the best performance as measured on a validation setup. It is free for the humans and it is expert from the difficult and the error prone hyperparameter tuning process. This process uh, is performed with grid search, atom search, and the uh, Bayesian method. Uh, there are some examples of the hyperparameter optimization. Uh, there are uh, first one is a momentum, and next one is a number of branches in a distance. Next one is a Bayesian optimization. Bayesian optimization is uh, designed as a global optimization strategy for a black box functions and it is used in your machine learning to tune the hyperparameters for the whole performance in your validation center. Uh, next one is a gradient based op optimization. It is specially used in case of neural networks and it computes the gradient with respect to the hyperparameters and optimize them using the gradient decent algorithm. Next one is a neural architecture search. It is the process of automating architecture engineering. It is designed. Uh, it is designed to work like a human brains, and the brains are very quick and to take a several distances. It is the subfield of the auto ML, and it has the significant overlap with the hyperparameter optimization and the meta learning. Uh, there are the three layers in the neural architecture search. First one is the input layer. Second one is the hidden layer. Third one is the output layer. There are several applications used in a neural architecture search. First one is the image recognition. Next one is a speech recognition. Next one is a machine translation. In an image recognition, there are so many reasons. Like uh, gender is a male or female, or color is a black or uh, white. 
next one is a metal in it. what is mean by metal meta means meta refers to the level above that means raising the level of abstraction one step and after refers to the information about something else meta learning refers to the machine learning algorithm that learn from the output of other machine learning algorithm and it refers to the learning algorithm like stacking and that learn how to combine the prediction from the ensemble users meta learning refers to the algorithm how to learn a prediction task and it is referred to as a multitask learning there are several uses in a meta learning it is used for the different machine models like q short learning reinforcement learning and the natural language processing and the auto ml tools are continued by panish with that using auto ml implementation the ml tools have also evolved with the time today people can easily work with machine learning by using many user defined user friendly tools in that we are going to see few of them first one ml box machine learning box is a open source python library and it can used to automate many aspects of model training these aspects include data data pre processing feature selection hyperparameter optimization data pre processing means there are several stages of to make the process easier first one data cleaning data integration data reduction and data transformation data cleaning is a clean data by replacing missing values correcting inconsistent data and removing outlier outliers feature selection feature selection or involves defining how many features which features are going to be used features are the data points used by the model to classify data sets feature selection is automated through the applications of algorithm during testing during testing features and combination of features are evaluated to determine how accurate the classification and prediction by that features second one is auto sql learn is an it is an open source open source python library use it, it uses the toolkit based on skykit learn skykit learn can used to perform model selection feature engineering and hyperparameter tuning it uses a bayesian optimization search procedure to discover top performing model pipeline for a given data set in addition to data preparation and models for a given data set it also learns from model that performed well in similar data set and create a group of top performing models now now challenges in auto ml is continued by tamrai children benefits of auto ml auto ml can help to leverage an ai within your organization it is an automate everything from gathering data to de deploying machine learning models so we can easily make statistical decisions there are three major parts uh, boost boost efficiency uh, it it can reduce the time complexity and it can have an 80% of optimization over the developers and scaling machine learning in your organization a scaling in a co company which for worth of values which it can add the advanced features for the maintenance and the developments uh, minimize the risk of an uh, human errors already we have seen an auto ml can be gathered data and it can reduce the human errors it uh, can uh, less involvement of the humans in on development there are some challenges of an auto ml implementation uh, there are uh, some of the uh, challenges are parallelization and optical resource utilization uh, the utilization of an uh, developer should be uh, depends upon the users uh, facing the risk which is uh, uh, need to issues can be released uh, result pollution and analysis uh, the, there are some questions which database can be choose how to connect which of the solution can be used to data visualization uh, auto ml uh, implementer lies and uh, few challenges such as uh, parallelization uh, result pollution uh, source optimization utilization machine learning is a pipeline provides a solution to answer those challenges with a clear definition of an process and auto features it can possible to achieve an consistency reliability scalability and portability at the end conclusion to consider yeah, i think uh, auto ml as an offer uh, an interesting approaches of an approaches to ai and will lower the ai enter barrier in many of cases 
as a result both uh, prototyping and same uh, scale ai solution can be get up and running with an virtual no cost auto ml and ai combines to make a revolution over the world thank you thank you for giving this opportunities thank you team for your efforts now it's time we move on to the question and answer session kindly post your questions in the chat box uh dr jay ganesh we have received the questions in through the registration form uh from the participants uh robin you can post them yeah. no no uh i have uh, projected that so these are the questions yes yeah. so the questions already if you have covered you can uh, ignore it so any new questions you can uh, you choose uh, and uh, answer it okay so let me start with the first question is it possible to make an ai inculcate human emotions on its own by self learning so this has been um, this has been a challenge um, for machine learning models because um, the models can only take decisions or they can only think in terms of what they have been exposed to and uh, and not just that uh, the the fuzzy aspects like for example the emotions the sadness fear happiness these are things ai models as of now cannot uh, you know cannot identify or make uh, maybe in the future you will find ai which has got some of these emotions human like emotions to a large extent that is what differentiates uh, some of us from some of these automated models does the use of ml leads to personal data leakage yes i mean it, it need not happen you know that way but uh, if you're not being careful in terms of uh, for example if you don't have best practices implemented in terms of uh, protecting personally identifiable information pii data as you call it i uh, you need to be careful you need to hide that pii data or not use the pii data for decision making it's important uh to put those checks and balances <clears throat> to prevent uh, personal data leakage we look at machine learning software almost how do we apply machine learning to hardware mm. um so machine learning is used to build hardware uh, and if you look at uh, some of the uh, gpu machines from nvidia uh they extensively use and the, a lot of the chips being built in the future which are emerging they use machine learning to build the uh, hardware and of course uh, gpu uh, chips from nvidia type of companies and of course there are several other chip makers like cerebras etc building their hardware systems which will accelerate a lot of machine learning models in the future i don't know about eco friendly material i'll skip that question um roadmap on learning ml prerequisites so what i would suggest is do some homework look at the course materials from coursera there are a lot of youtube videos which will let you get started with uh, some of the roadmap you, there you will get to know some of those technical non technical skills i spoke about the technical skills um so python is an important language a programming language which is becoming extremely popular and prevalent in the data science uh, ecosystem pytorch uh, tensorflow uh, r r studio most importantly python and related technologies are extremely important non technical skills it, it is good to have you have some business knowledge about the problem you are trying to solve empathy towards the data uh, your team members etc because uh, and of course a practice ethical practices in terms of not using pii data to make decisions etc and not bring in your biases for data uh, uh, for for building the models what is the advantage of specializations uh, specializations i don't know about this is a very generic question so i'll skip that in what way the farmlands can be protected from flood and heavy rain any improvised technologies techniques to manage them uh, i don't know about ai uh, helping against heavy rain but i've seen ai being leveraged for computer vision to identify if the farm is ready for uh, you know uh, 
uh, irrigation or ready for the sowing, et cetera, et cetera. I've seen people leveraging um, satellite images, uh, automatically analyzing these images of farm models, et cetera. I've seen, uh, I've read case studies of um, John Deary, the tractor manufacturer who's got a lot of sensors, which measures a lot of the soil characteristics, uh, the humidity, the temperature, the presence of bacteria, et cetera. And it will analyze this data and automatically recommend the farmers what they need to do. So industry is leveraging some of those things. Uh, if you want to be self-sufficient in ML knowledge, I spoke about that. Uh, look at some of those better courses in uh, some of, there are several free courses available, uh, sign up for some of them uh, and start, uh, you know, picking up some of those basics. And some of those courses are well-structured and you'll get to learn from the basics and go into more advanced topics. Are there any other questions? Uh, we have one question from Bhavya. Bhavya, are you there? Yes, I'm here, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Go ahead. So good evening, Mr. Jay. I'm Bhavya from KIT. So as you spoke this evening, one thing that I could realize was that this whole process of machine learning this monitoring, tracking, integration, and so on is completely application oriented. So as a student, I would love to have direct exposure to all of this process. So is there any chance for us to get a two week or a four week internship or any hands on training for us to learn and know directly from the industry? Yeah, in fact, we offer full, uh, you know, we offer two months training for students. So those who are interested, uh, you know, send us your resumes. We will, uh, you know, we will. Right now, we are in the process of interviewing the students for internships with us. We just, um, you know, finished interviewing the candidates from ID Kanpur. We are interviewing from Narsimhanji Institute and several other places, um, several colleges in Bangalore also. So, if you're interested for an internship with us, send us your resume, and we will pass you, put you through the interview process and. Um, and believe me, in the interview, we are not going to ask you much about machine learning. We'll, we'll expose you to some of those as part of the interview, uh, as part of the internship. So if you're interested, send us your resumes, and then we will take it forward from there. Sure, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jay Ganesh. Uh, now I request Mr. CNC. Uh, 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 Robin. Yes. I just I'm intervening. Uh, Ram here, uh, Dr. Jay. So... I just yeah. wanted to say it was, you know, power packed and like a degree coffee, you know, what you gave. And then uh, I hope the students' presentations were up to the mark. But uh, something mundane I want to ask, you know, I am from the manufacturing industry, F typically foundry, mechanical or and metallurgy. It may be a very basic question. We had challenges in uh, uh, various process parameters, incoming raw material, process control, and uh, timely replacement of machine wire parts. Sometimes we replace them when it's not necessary. Sometimes there are breakdowns. So these are the things. And uh, I was working in the old uh, uh, you know, situation. Though we have a lot of data, it's not, uh, you know, and uh, there is a drift in the process. We have a uh, defined the parameters for acceptance and rejection in a wide range. But we find that though the parameters, process parameters look okay, but the products turn out defective or there is a variation in quality. And then we have to revisit uh, whether what we have defined is correct. Now, how does it help a typical manufacturing setup like this in, your, in the domain of machine learning? See, um, it's difficult to answer, um, you know, all the challenges uh, you mentioned. There are several interventions you can think of. Mm -hmm. One is um, there is this concept of process mining mm -hmm. where you gather intelligence from the process logs of the various systems you have. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, each one of your systems typically will have some logs captured. Uh, there are mechanisms to understand the logs and uh, create the process maps and then start simulating the arrival of materials, the work in progress steps, and of course, the final quality control. So you can essentially map the entire steps, understand mm -hmm. how much of time and effort and energy is being spent in each one of the steps. Potentially, if there are any shortcuts being used or you know, uh, all those things you can analyze. Then you can bring in others, other interventions in terms of computer vision-based approaches for each step in the process, which is, a very, which is used in many of these advanced manufacturing factories. 
in terms of uh, taking pictures, high resolution pictures at various stages in the production process to check for quality control, which is something which is being used quite regularly. Uh, so at any every stage, if the, if the item is doesn't meet certain quality criteria, it could be as simple as identifying there are some damages, uh, there are some cuts or whatever it is, potentially you can use those uh, high high vision cameras, high definition cameras to take pictures and take important decision whether this item should go forward or it is automatically kicked out of the entire process. Then you can have mechanisms for uh, you know, monitoring the behavior of the workers or the people who are on the shop floor. Are they following best practices in terms of the various activities they do? Typically, you know, uh, typically the, uh, the workshops will have, the factory floors will have standard processes for those workers to follow. Uh, are they following them? You can have a video processing, video analytic based approaches for identifying uh, what they do. Are they following the standard approaches? So all these interventions, I'm just giving you a handful and can be leveraged for uh, solving some of those problems, you Okay. So just in, just in terms of sharing, uh, yeah, it, it's uh, useful what you said, just for the benefit of the people, I am just giving an example. You know, you pour the metal into the mold and then it takes five to 10 seconds to fill, but this guy is supposed to ensure that it is uh, following a particular procedure. But if it's not on camera, you don't have no way to say whether he has poured or, uh, correctly or not. And then you assume he is poured correctly. So from what you said, I got one very useful input because applying my knowledge. And then we are uh, measuring the chemistry, but we should know how the metal is actually solidifying. So there are other uh, technologies and simulations that have come into the field. So I was just trying to understand, uh, you know, how this can be applied. So probably I do find that I caught on to one of what you said. So it's useful. And I'm just sharing this with the group because some of them may be of the core engineering. So they should just set their minds thinking. So thank you. Thank you very much. That was a good uh, thing. Yes, now I request Mr. Uh, CNC to give a vote of thanks. Sure, CNC? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is it uh, good? Audio is good? Yes. I'm yes. a very poor network. I switch off my camera. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jay. I think I'll start with uh, Dr. Prabhakaran, Vice Principal of uh, Academics, uh, SRM Ramapuram. Thank you, sir, uh, for your nice outline with your rich experience in the academic world. You outlined the importance of a session like this. And uh, thank you for your appreciative words for PAL's effort. Uh, do you, you also, you know, underscored, uh, you know, importance of academia and industry. And, you know, that's exactly what we are doing here bringing an expert like Dr. Jai Ganesh from Emphasis for a session like this. Uh, thank you, sir, for your nice words. And uh, Dr. Jai Ganesh, it, is, it was very, very interesting session. You know, when I learned engineering, I learned about machining. Now, today, I learned about machine learning from you and also from the students who nicely presented. And, you know, you, you know initially, you set the stage by painting 2021 internet uh, minutes and uh, you know about exabytes and it's taking on to the industry which is actually uh, churning out uh, you know huge amount of exabytes and how important it is to build a scalable machine learning system thank you very much uh, for uh, this nice session in one hour actually shared so much for students to you know pick up you know, every slide that you had you know could be a research slide for students to go back and you know uh, read through uh, the you know, material or score, register for a course you suggested in course here or in PTEL or whatever and expand on their learning. Actually, it's, an, it's a good eye opener. Thank you for this. Look forward to more sessions from you. I mean, your schedule permitting, we know that you are extremely busy. Sorry to interrupt in your schedule, but you know, it is very important for us to bring such a person who is deep hands on with the latest technology to share. So some of the questions that students have is how do we fill the industry gap? Same that uh, Dr. Uh, Prabhakar also mentioned. Now, moving on to students, actually, firstly, congrats to the top performers in the short quiz, five questions. 
And I noticed that uh, some of the top performers also were their student presentation, especially from the first presentation. So the second presentation, I got cut off. I couldn't really see the student names. Uh, I could see some names, you know, uh, top scorers, uh, congratulations, and very nicely presented. I'm sure uh, Dr. Jay Ganesh also will have probably you know, good uh, words to say about the presentation. I think, uh, you know, I felt that uh, the student presentation was an extension of uh, some other things, maybe basic, but I think uh, for a learner like me, uh, you know, it, it was very helpful to read through students' presentation. It was nice. And uh, thank you, Shiva Pariya, for nicely being an MC for today and uh, PMO uh, for, you know, uh, organizing all the logistics around for hosting the show. I end this uh, word of thanks. If I don't want to take too much time going on saying something or the other. Thanks a lot to all the, part uh, all the attendees. Back to you, Shivapriya, Robin. Uh, thank you, Mr. CNC. Uh, the, I request the participants uh, to submit the feedback and the online quiz, which is posted in the chat box, both in Zoom as well as YouTube. So please submit the feedback and the online quiz. So uh, before that, uh, I request uh, Dr. Jagnish a few words about the student presentation. Is there any feedback? It is one of the typical things that we request uh, the main speaker, keynote speaker to share with the students so that they can improve upon because they're all students learning, learning this kind of uh, thing. So your feedback will be very valuable to them. Sure. Now, I think, I think uh, the students uh, did a good job of, um, you know, researching and, uh, and presenting. Uh, I enjoyed both the presentations. Uh, so, but um, you know, you, you can always improve. So that is the learning process. So what I would, I would encourage you to, do this is that repeat the same thing what you did today um, given the fact that you are exposed to a whole bunch of uh, approaches and methodologies in today's discussion assume that you learned a few new things today how will you do this entire presentation again let me ask that if you are if you are going to do the same presentation again tomorrow or next week uh, after you have gone through this talk uh, and try and Relook at what you presented and how will you present it differently given the learnings of today. It is just a voluntary thing. Look at it as just a way to improve your knowledge. Maybe it will help you, uh, you know, uh, because it's always a learning process. Good job for both the teams. Thank you so much. Uh, I so you, forgot Peter. about this internship that you offered. Thank you so much for uh, you know, offering to look at some of these people for internship. If you could give a one or two line of spec that you're looking for, the student specs that you're looking for. We will follow up, coordinate with the, the students based on the spec and get the resumes and share with you. That will be helpful. Sure. So basically, we are looking at uh, internships, uh, students who are interested in data science and machine learning. So uh, people who are good at Python, hands-on Python developers, feel free to apply. Yeah, so semester, uh, would you know which semester? Typically, typically we offer in the last semester uh, because that is when they are relatively free. Last semester, many colleges will have um, compulsory internship requirements, uh, and um, that is the time we, uh, you know, typically, for example, in Bangalore, there is this college university called PES University, so they have a six months internship the last year. So I, I have students from there who are doing six months internship. I have, uh, you know, uh, we have students from Narsimonji uh, BTEC uh, program in data science. They have again a six months internship, and then there are two months internships. So given the fact that everything is remote nowadays, uh, earlier we used to have the internships only during summer and uh, and people used to do this internship with us, but now given everything is remote and colleges are becoming more flexible, we have opened this internship throughout the year. So only for final year students. Okay. So typically the internship are two months to three months, at least two months to three months with hands-on Python knowledge. So that is all you expect. So if you're interested, um, you can collate the resumes. We will put you through the interview process uh, and then uh, we will uh, select a few of you guys. Thank you, Jen. Yeah. Okay, Robin. Thank you, sir. Next? Okay. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Jay. I think only the students have some tasks. They have to uh, give the feedback. Uh, as far as we are concerned, we are done. 
and uh, thanks a lot thank you sir thank, thank you nice thanks nice everyone day. thanks for the opportunity have a nice day good day good job ram ah nalla 